30 seconds. Fifteen. Five, four, three, two. Hi, good morning, everybody. I am um, Krista Griffith. I'm a state representative and co-chair with Julie Devlin of the Aging in Place uh, Working Group subgroup uh, that deals with financial and legal barriers. Um, today is Monday, um, November 15th, and we are meeting today to discuss, um, it's an, a kickoff meeting really, to um, narrow the focus of what our work will be in the coming months to discuss some of the legal and financial issues that impact uh, seniors um, in their ability to stay in their homes. Um, it's quite a broad topic. Um, we, it looks like we are having a little bit of um, an issue this morning with getting a full um, subgroup committee uh, together, but I'm so thankful that four of us have been able to join. So what we'll do today is to start just start by introducing ourselves and then um, explain sort of what our interest and background is in this particular area of the subgroup. Um, and then um, go into some of the issues. In the meantime, um, we hope others will join. And I do see um, we're having somebody new come in, so that's good. Good morning, Kimberly, and welcome. Good morning, thank you. Um, could you, is your camera able to work? Very good, thank you. Um, so again, I'm Krista Griffith, uh, state representative for the Tulsa District, and I am. Um, so I, I, I I'm, on, I'm the co-chair of the the actual aging in place working group, and I, I am co-chair of this subgroup uh, based on my background, which prior to being a state representative, I served as the head of Attorney General Bill Biden's Senior Protection Initiative for several years when I worked at the Delaware Department of Justice, and in that role. I uh, was uh, lead prosecutor for elder abuse uh, investigations and cases, and also uh, chaired a um, multi-faceted uh, task force representing um, healthcare professionals, law enforcement uh, folks, attorneys, um, forensic nurses, et cetera, who, that looked at, um, you know, essentially um, the all issues surrounding uh, protecting seniors. Um, so I have a deep seated interest in this topic and um, my specific, uh, you know, my specific interest on this will be, and I'm an attorney, uh, so that legal aspect um, interests me as well. So um, we'll be looking at uh, that, that part of, um, of our group. Um, and now I'm going to introduce Julie and ask Julie, co-chair, to say a few words to good morning, Julie. Good morning and thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Julie Devlin. I'm a senior planner with the Division of Services for Aging and Adults with Physical Disabilities or DSAPIT. And I'm also the legal services developer for the state. Um, and what that is, um, our big federal funding source, the Older Americans Act, designates a legal services or legal assistance developer in all 50 states and all of the territories um, in the United States. And so for Delaware, I've been assigned that position. And my role is to help those who are aging, so 60 and older, advocate for legal services. I also work with the Delaware State Bar in doing um, continuing legal education around senior issues and also make sure that services are available for seniors as they age. And one of the services that we offer is a legal services program um, that is run through Community Legal Aid Society or CLASI. And um, that's available to anybody 60 and older. And that's one of the programs I help advocate for. And I'm also part of the Senior Protection Initiative that Representative Griffith spoke about. Um, 
um, and I do a bunch of stuff, but I also help do a lot of planning related to adult protective services. And that's one of the things that's been discussed in the aging in place uh, work group. Um, and for this specific subgroup related to exploitation. And so I manage a couple grants related to that. And so my interests are varied. Um, I'm also an attorney by trade. And so legal is definitely my background as well. Perfect. Thank you, Julie. Mm -hmm. And good morning, Amy. Um, Amy, if you could introduce yourself and um, tell us where you work and why this particular subgroup is of interest to you. Hi, everybody. I'm Amy Milligan. I am the executive director of St. Francis Life, which is a PACE program, which means a program of all-inclusive care for the elderly. Um, we partnered with the state to start this program back. It's been nine years now with the goal of having additional community-based services for the elderly that maybe would like to remain in their home throughout their life versus uh, a nursing home. So we um, support um, the elderly in all facets related to social and medical needs. So we have a, a 27,000 square foot facility on the riverfront and we just opened one on College Avenue in Newark. And within that business, we have the primary care program primary care program, a rehab program, adult day, transportation, nutrition, social work, and home care. And they're all businesses that work together to help the elderly remain in the community. Um, I am very committed to um, getting them the quality care and services they need. And as many of us have found, either through caring for our parents or being uh, in a supportive role in the community with aging that um, being able to stay with your family, with your stuff, and your home is oftentimes um, a last phase of life goal. And so we try to do that for those um, people in Delaware. And it's a very, um, it's a, it's a mission-based program and it's a wonderful commitment. And the fact that we just opened a second site in Newark allows us to maybe service another 250 people. So um, the barriers uh, for the elderly in the community are, you know, many, and these two particular areas of interest because we do deal with um, some of the financial and legal risks um, that our members go through in trying to uh, be independent in the community. Thank you, Amy, um, and welcome. Glad to have you. Thank you. Jamie, good morning. Um, same questions to you. Hi, good morning. Again, I apologize for my voice. Uh, I am, again, Jamie Ramage. I'm the owner of a home health aid only licensed agency here in Delaware. It's called Comfort Keepers. I provide care in both Newcastle and Kent County. Um, I'm also on, on this um, work group uh, from the perspective of, uh, you'll hear DOC, that stands for, that's the acronym for the Delaware Association for Home and Community Care. So I'm the president of the board um, of that group. And so that DOC represents um, from, I think it's, I'm gonna say more than 60, more than 60 licensed agencies and that covers the three levels of licensure, which is personal assistance services agencies, home health aid only agencies, as well as skilled care agencies. And there are also hospice. So that's who, those are the core members of, of our association. So we represent home care from all levels of licensure. Um, and I'm coming you know, to this board with not only representing them, but also from you know, the experience of, of my, my own agency as well. Um, my background prior to this, uh, was consulting. So um, in all honesty, I don't know exactly how I got on this subgroup, but that's all, it's all good. <laughs> we wanted to have doc representation on all the various subgroups. Well, it's so, great. It's wonderful to have you. And I'm sure with um, running the business that you run and, and interacting with your clients that you're going to have some 
uh, anecdotal evidence for us to consider in terms of the these these barriers. And I yeah, think absolutely. And um, I um, I also take on both Medicaid waiver clients as well as private pay clients, so I can talk to those two different aspects. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. And good morning, um, Kimberly. Thank you for joining us. And um, if you could please introduce yourself, tell us uh, your, the, uh, where you work and why uh, legal and financial barriers to aging in place is an uh, important topic for, for you. Sure, thank you. Um, I'm Kim Roman. I am the Director of Care Transitions for Christiana Care Home Health. Um, we are a, um, a both Medicare certified and um, non-certified agency caring for over um, 1,500 patients statewide. Um, and um, we support the state's largest health system with their transitions from the acute care to home. And um, being the, the contact for a lot of those um, case managers or um, acute care providers, I, I um, experience um, a lot of the work that goes into overcoming the barriers to uh, transition uh, our patients back to home. Or likewise, when we have primary care practices that are trying to keep their patients at home and avoiding the hospitals, helping them find resources to overcome those barriers as well. And those barriers are not always um, medical care or healthcare related. There's a lot of psychosocial um, issues that um, people need to overcome to allow them to stay at home. And um, one of the lessons learned through the COVID-19 pandemic was that any care that we can provide in the home um, should be provided in the home as um, our uh, citizens age and want to age in place. Um, and even if it's not in their own home, um, I, I am a nurse. Um, I've worked in post-acute care for 25 years, both um, in the community with home health and hospice, but I also um, spend some time in licensed care, like assisted livings and in independent living communities. And so I know the natural progression of um, someone who is not able to remain in their home yet um, isn't appropriate for skilled nursing. So those little, um, those little gray areas where people call home um, and um, have kind of um, done some of um, that work in the community as well to support those transitions. So um, oftentimes, um, financial resources, not only for um, living accommodations, but home repairs or transportation um, all become barriers. So um, I am an advocate um, for the elderly, um, both um, professionally and personally, having my own um, experience with my own um, family members who aged in place and um, moved through the transitions. And I'm excited to be part of the group. Thank you, Kim, and we're excited to have you. Um, wonderful, um, wonderful experience. And I'm now looking forward to introducing Robin. Robin Mooney, good morning. Um, welcome to the subgroup. If you could introduce yourself, let us know where you work and what your interest is in terms of our work here on the subgroup, which is looking at the legal and financial barriers to aging in place. Would, would you mind unmuting Robin? Sorry, <laughs> thank you. That'd be a good idea, right? Hi, my name is Robin Mooney. I own Carpe Vita Home Care. We are a non-medical uh, licensed in the state of Delaware home health aid only agency, um, just like Jamie at Comfort Keepers. I also sit on the board of directors for the DHCC. And um, we also take uh, Medicaid clients and private pay. And I guess um, the reason I'm interested in being on this subcommittee is that I do find in our private pay clients that cost is a barrier for people uh, to get um, non-medical home care. A lot of them think that Medicare is gonna cover and it does not. Um, so there's so many people that 
that need this kind of help in the home and then they end up not getting it because they can't afford to pay for it. So I'm excited to see what we can do here. Excellent, excellent points. Thank you, thank you all. Um, we have a wonderful group and um, I know that there are others who aren't with us today who will hopefully be at the next one um, and we can um, get started. Julie, um, before we turn to the ne next um, item, is there anything that you wanted to say regarding our committee and um, some of the priorities that we're gonna be looking at? No, um, just that I'm excited for the recommendations that will come out of this specific subgroup. I think it's really important for us to address the financial barriers. Our division hears that the most. Um, people come to us because they can't, they're not on Medicaid and they can't afford private pay. And um, you've probably heard we have waiting lists. We can't unfortunately serve everybody because of our limited budget as much as we want to serve people. And so we're very interested in ensuring that people are able to get the services that they need in order to age in place. Terrific, thank you. So the next item on our agenda um, is looking at our the expectations and the timeline of our work. Um, earlier on our call, I talked about the broadness of our uh, title of our subgroup. And um, I want us to be effective and efficient um, with our time and really be able to produce some recommendations that we will be able to roll out in a in a in a way. And if we can't, um, and if it's not legislative changes, something that we can enact between agencies to really assist seniors um, and and help with their independence and deal with some of those issues um, that, especially those that Robin just mentioned, with not you know the private pay not being able to afford certain things um, that 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 would help them and not knowing what is covered and what isn't. Um, to me, a lot of our, the, a lot of the issues um, surround communication and really having a clear grasp on, on what um, is covered for folks and what isn't and how do people know what that information is. It seems like, and I don't know if this is true for, um, and, and if, if it's true, maybe you can nod your head or, or say no or, or disagree, but it seems like so many families when they go through this have to reinvent the wheel every single time because they don't know and so the the time and the process that it takes to educate um individuals going through this is and, and it's happening a lot of times at some of the worst possible times in their lives you know when when they aren't able to to handle all of the information at once so um i'd like for us to really be able to um narrow in on some top five, you know, some, some top five issues that we would like to see fixed. Um, and so I think my, my thought is between now and our next meeting, which we'll uh, work on, um, we'll work on setting up uh, at, at the end of, of the meeting today, um, we should look at, uh, at each of us spending some time between now and that next meeting and kind of thinking hard about what are the top five barriers, legal or financial, that you see in your daily work and experiences that impact seniors. Um, so that's the thought I have. Uh, any, any comments on that idea? We, I think we can all come up with five. <laughs> There's a lot. <laughs> And if you need 10, it's okay, or 20. I mean, I mean, really, I mean, I think there's gonna go go for the list. I mean, don't stop, like brainstorm with the list, yeah. with the list. What I'm thinking is once we get our list, we're gonna have some crossover. And when we have that crossover, then we'll know more really what 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 areas we need to really hone in on. Um, but yeah, no, I agree, Amy. I think that <laughs> I didn't mean to say five. I mean, what we'll do is come up with a five or ten, something like right. that. Um, Julie. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Um, yeah, I, I'm just thinking, I'm thinking in my head, all the different things. And I do agree with you, Representative Griffith, there, that communication is one of the big barriers that that we see from our perspective at DeSapa, especially when it comes to legal, the legal side of things. Um, 
as well as having a proactive approach to when we're thinking of legal that because that can help solve some of the financial barriers that we often see when people are in crisis. So do you think, Julie, that it would be, and then um, this is the other question. So um, we see everybody here. Have you thought of any, is anyone here on this call thought of colleagues that you think would be wonderful additions to this group? And if you do think of anybody that has, this, be it an attorney maybe who handles private cases a lot or uh, someone in law enforcement that handles the investigation aspects or whatever it is, that's the other the area other area of homework. Certainly, uh, because we're a subgroup, we have some more leeway in terms of um, having membership on this group. And so I think um, if there are folks that you think are not at the table here on this subgroup, um, in addition to the list um, that you're coming up with in terms of the barriers, think of those people too, and and let let me know and Julie know if if there are any other individuals that you think would uh, really help our conversation and and um, boost our our our, um, our ability to get some things accomplished because sometimes I think groups come together, but then there's always like, oh, but you know, I know somebody over here is excellent at this and, and they want to participate. I really want to try to avoid those silo issues that happen um, when, with so many different groups and organizations. Um, how, what do you think of that um, idea? Can I, can I ask, has an elder law attorney group been invited? I, you know, when I think of Medicaid waiver, I'll just, I'll just give you my little spiel because there are some clients like Robin says they call in and um, they're, you know, they can start with private pay initially, but they want to get set up with Medicaid waiver. And I, I literally say to them, I know, I know enough to be dangerous. I know, I, I know there are multiple ways to become eligible, depending upon their resources. <clears throat> Sometimes they can use an elder law attorney to get things set up. Otherwise, there's another company I've referred to before called Medicaid Plus that I don't think is as pricey as an elder law attorney, but apparently helps them to get the application set up, you know, filled out all the doc supporting documentation together, et cetera. Um, and then I think, so if you go from elder law attorney to like a service like Medicaid Plus down to maybe what a case manager or a social worker that would help to do that at no cost. So I reached out to the elder law section of the Delaware Bar, the president or the chair of the section currently. And then I also reached out to um, the person who runs the elder law program at Classy that we fund as a division. Okay. And so um, I haven't heard back from them yet, but I'm hopeful that that's both of them or um, somebody else that they're associated with will join this subgroup. Gotcha, I think that would be beneficial. Excellent, excellent point, Jamie. And thank you, Julie, for taking those additional steps to do that. Uh, DVLS also has a seniors issue. Jackie Chacona might be somebody to that, that we can consider inviting to. Um, all right, so that's another, uh, so those two, two um, uh, we're, we're just starting the meeting and usually homework comes at the end, but. <laughs> since, since this is a kickoff meeting i think it's okay um all right so those are the two things for the expectations and the timeline is i think you know we'll really look at uh working hard in the next uh four months to come up with some good some good recommendations and some good ideas to, to improve things um in terms of the the meeting time how is this time ge time generally on a monday for everybody Yes, no, thumbs up. Do we need to send out, uh, you know, I'd like to try to get something consistent on our calendar. I'm not wedded to Mondays at 11, but if this works, um, then we could uh, we could look at that. So let's just go around the room. Julie, how, are, how is this date and time for you? Wonderful, but I'm flexible. Okay. Um, Jamie, yes. Hi. I'm good. I mean, Mondays, every day is a Monday sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> How about Amy, Robin, Kim? Yeah, I'm, I'm okay with it. I think one of the things that happens to me sometimes is I might have to leave a little early because I get something else that I have to do, but mon this is fine. Okay. 
Um, it's it's I'm with Jamie. Uh, Mondays are Mondays and not always great, but I can make it work. And then I have friends like Jamie who will text me and say, "You're going to get on the call." Okay, that's <laughs> terrific. And because I get caught up in the Monday. And and this can work for me too. Um, once it's on the calendar, then no one else would be able to um, put anything in this spot. So I'm good. Okay. Well, then I'm going to propose our next meeting be November 29th at 11, which is a Monday. I just will make sure I'll have to double check with Will to make sure I'm not violating any um, FOIA um, notice requirements. So I think it's 10 days, but if it's two weeks plus, we may have to look at a different date, but I will, we will follow up with that um, at the next, uh, at the, we will follow up that with that in an email to everybody. Okay, with that, we have on our agenda a discussion of available services and eligibility requirements. Julie, I'm putting on the spot, I'm gonna turn this over to you uh, to see how you wanna address um, this particular issue that's on our agenda. Again, I think it's one that's gonna probably be a standing, a standing agenda item, because we're gonna have to dive into it. I, uh, one thing I'm wondering is if uh, you have any ideas on which programs we need to focus the most on to have a, it come up to understanding on. Yeah, I, I mean, I was coming at it from what kind of services that we offer through the state that anybody who is 60 and older can utilize. And so it doesn't matter, you know, what your funding is like, what kind of resources that you have, you're eligible for um, our services. Um, and I think that there's a lot of misconceptions out there about state services they think oh you know it's really when you you really need the help is when you do it you know but to sap it especially our elder law program um anybody can can do it and it doesn't matter what kind of resources or income that you have and i think that is the biggest thing i want to get across because we could be utilizing that program more efficiently i think um, and Classy does a great job with our elder law program. I don't want to say that they don't, but it can really help people plan out um, their future care needs, uh, including staying at home longer so that they're not institutionalized if that's what they choose. Um, and I know that there's other programs out there. And so, um, but we offer a lot of our services, like I said, under the Older Americans Act. If you're 16 and older, you qualify. And if you're a Delaware resident, that's terrific. And for those who are watching, um, you know, or, or will watch this recording later, can you just give us sort of an overview of all the array of services oh, that the yeah. staff <laughs> provides? So, so we provide a ton of home and community-based services that if you're 60 and older, you can participate in. And that's everything from home delivered meals, like Meals on Wheels, to congregate meals, where you would go to, say, a senior center like Cheer or Modern Maturity um, and um, do communal dining with people. Uh, we also offer personal care, uh, legal services, like I mentioned, um, ERS uh, emergency response system, which is like the pendant that people wear. I fall in and I can't get up. We have that. Um, several community programs where we get people out in the communities to socialize. Obviously, it looks a little bit different with COVID, um, but we're making it work. We support senior centers. Uh, we have caregiver services, adult day services. Um, we also provide respite for caregivers of all ages uh, who who work with or who are caring for their loved ones that are 60 and older. Um, trying to think, we really have a lot, and we have adult protective services. And so, if um, um, if you come across any kind of abuse, neglect, or exploitation of someone 60 or older, or someone who has disabilities, you would call our division, and we would respond to that and look into those allegations. Um, but we also do the Aging and Disability Resource Center, which I think is really important to know about for anybody who is aging or just needs to ask questions. So that's a call line that they can call. And it's 1-800-223-9074. And any kind of questions, not just about our services, but any services in the Delaware Aging Network or Disability Network, they can call. Um, and I need help with my long-term care Medicaid application and they can connect them with someone to help them with that um, or any kind of services, including private pay services. That's can you repeat that phone number? Sure, and I'll put it in the chat box too. It, uh, I can't put it in the chat box, but it's 1-800-223-9074. 
Now for providers that are on our subcommittee, um, is any of this information that Julie gave, um, is, did you know all of it or is some of it new to you? Is this, in, you know, is this, did you, wh how, how are you, and because, you know, you're, you're experts here and, uh, and on the front lines in a lot of ways. So are you aware of, of all of the services that DSAPID provides? And if not, which ones are you not familiar with? Because it seems that then we need to, as a state, to do better to communicate that to, um, to, to, to you. I'm aware of them just from what we do because we have a lot of we we you know work with some of these services, um, uh, but I do think you're right. It is not necessarily um, universal knowledge, especially with the elderly population, that these services are available. Um, this is Kim Roman. Oh, I'm sorry, and I, I am also just wanted to add. I'm aware of. Um, many of these services, um, but listening to Julie made me um, consider, are my social workers and colleagues also aware? Um, um, because a lot of this is um, what uh, we may um, do or um, discharge our, our home care clients with um, some of these loose ends hanging. So I'm wondering, you know, is the healthcare community also aware? Yeah, and I'll just add, we also have a care transitions unit um, that works with people who are leaving uh, the facility, a long-term care facility to go back home or leaving a hospital to go to a long-term care facility or hospital to home and need services in the community. And it's a small but mighty unit of ours, but we definitely have that available and we're required to um, based on our federal funding. And, and I was just gonna chime in to say, I, I pretty much was aware of the services. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. And let me give you a little background. I'm, I'm not a Delawarean. I'm, I'm actually live in Pennsylvania, still do and come down. So I was new to Delaware um, seven years ago when, when my husband and I bought the business. And so to learn, to learn it all, I've been just, you know, drinking from the fire hose, if you will. Correct me if I'm wrong, if there used to be this big book, I don't think it's a big book that's published anymore, but is, is, is that what you're talking about in terms of so we all, we produce the guide to services, which is probably yes. what you're talking about. Yes, yeah. exactly. The last time we published it was, I believe, right before the pandemic, maybe a couple months before the pandemic. We still have copies available. So you would just call that 1-800 number if you want more copies of it. Okay. Um, but uh, the, so we have that and that, that goes through, you know, any service out there, private pay, not private pay. It's not all inclusive, but it's a published book. And we're going to continue publishing it. So uh, we just do it like every couple of years because it's a costly thing. Gotcha. And then, um, if you go to DelawareADRC.com, it's a searchable database for all the types of resources that are in that guide, plus additional ones. And that's up to date. It's continuously updated. Okay. Yeah, the guide. Yeah, right. The guide's online, right, Julie? The guide is also online at the Deceptive yeah, website. I, I, I've, I've, I've used that book since I started my career in all the re iterations. Now I just kind of send the online link to, you know, some staff. Yeah. Right. And if, you, if, you need, if you need hard copies, just let us know. We have a whole closet full right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what was initially given to me as a really great resource. So that's why I wanted to bring that up. Is Can I ask, is... 211 still a thing and is that associated with your group so, as well? 211 is still very much a thing. It's a hybrid program with the state and United Way and um, it's not the same thing as our Aging and Disability Resource Center which is fully staffed by state employees. However, um, through the pandemic um, we're leveraging partnerships with 211 and they're actually going to start running our website in the coming months uh, for the ADRC. And so you'll be oh, able to great. access um, aging services and disability services right through the 211 website and get real-time data on the type of services that people are getting. And Julie, could you please have your staff send 62 of those books over to the General Assembly? <laughs> I can do that, absolutely. 
Um, that would be wonderful. And um, to every uh, senator and, and representative, um, that would be great. Now, I um, something that caught my eye, I am on a listserv um, regarding still um, elder abuse, even though it's been a long time since I've been involved. But the good thing about this listserv is it, it lists um, legislation occurring in states across the country um, on a variety of topics related to elder care, uh, staying at home, et cetera. And, and one uh, piece of legislation caught my eye. Uh, Illinois in August of uh, this year passed a law that requires uh, their state's division of aging to um, include a fact sheet uh, with the toll-free numbers and access information to seniors um, on for various health conditions, elder abuse, and such programs that DeSapid offers. So, you know, even though here in Delaware, I think we provide the websites for those things to our seniors, actually having that fact sheet in hand, especially for those who are not as adept at technology as others has been, uh, has was something that the Illinois uh, General Assembly thought would be helpful. Um, so I'm gonna send some information to this subgroup uh, to discuss more fully at the next meeting, but I think it goes to that communication piece. You know, I certainly sometimes you ha hand paper out and it just goes in the trash. We don't, I don't want it to become something like that, but you know, looking at sort of creative useful tools to be able to explain more about what programs exist. Um, so uh, the, again, this is, this is a fact sheet to those home delivered meal recipients. Um, and it's done as a practical means to increase awareness of state resources and services, uh, particularly for those uh, individuals not comfortable with technology. Um, so I think there are, through our, what is it, about 6,200 seniors are receiving um, Meals on Wheels programs. So it's, I mean, that's a very large group of people who uh, might benefit from that. So any, any thoughts on that particular idea? I mean, I think that's a great idea and we've utilized, our division has utilized uh, putting things in um, the meals boxes um, in the past. Um, I specifically remember a brochure related to financial exploitation because uh, we had a grant available that we could do that, but I don't see why we wouldn't be able to put in other information in the boxes. It's pretty easy. I was just going to chime in with, I, from a regulation standpoint, we need to include in our in-home packet for our clients that we get set up with service, the phone number for, I'm going to call it like the Office of Licensing and Facilities. So it's not necessarily DeSapid's phone number, but it, you know, it's a number where they would report any concerns or complaints. So from a a regulatory perspective, we have to do that. And then <clears throat> the state had asked us to include um, some like emergency um, preparedness type of literature to them. And um, the state, I wanna say it was called the buddy. <laughs> but, preparedness buddy. The yeah. buddy, okay, yeah. See, I know enough to be dangerous, Julie. Let's just <laughs> try to keep it all straight. <laughs> So they have this buddy paper that, that they had um, provided or, you know, agencies could pretty much do a derivation of, of their own with similar information. So I, I know that that is in the works and or it already in the hands and in the packets that go out to our clients, but it, it might be nice to have something, you know, standard across the board. Oh, definitely. Thank, thank you. Thanks, Jamie. Are there any presentations that anybody on our subgroup would like to know more about? Are there any organizations um, that you want to know more from in terms of services uh, that are out there? One thing that would be helpful is if you remind us the other subcommittees, because I'm trying to get my head around our goal versus theirs. So I guess I can go back and read, but um, no, Amy, that's a good point. I was actually trying to search that. I was actually looking yeah. for that specific document. I think there was, it went out one time with the various descriptions. So yeah. we'll, we'll circulate that again. Again, I, I think what we really need, to, what we're going to be doing at our next meeting is really honing in on what our objectives and goals are to make sure that um, it's, it's, it's a manageable subject because 
Yeah. Again, I think we could spend 20 years on legal and financial barriers to aging in yeah. place, and then we're going to be aging in place by the time that we get there. So um, let's uh, let's try to let's let's do that, and then we'll, we'll that's a great point. We'll we'll send that out. Um, uh, Julie, is there any um, anything else regarding that part of um, part four of our agenda, which is available services and eligibility requirements? No, and I, I think that once we figure out, you know, the top five or ten issues, it's going to be help more helpful for us to talk about the services that really hone in on those issues. Yeah, I agree. I feel like once we pick pick those topics, then. It is possible that based on all you said, Julie, we might want a little more detail about some piece of it, you know, of what's available. Okay. Well, I think we have, um, the, you know, the good thing about today is our meeting is going to be a, a lot shorter than probably our other ones. So I'm a big proponent of using time wisely and not having everyone stick around for an hour and a half um, just because. So, because I know we, you have a lot to do and a lot of people to serve. Um, we are now at the section of uh, public comment. So Mike, if you could please uh, let us know if there's anybody on uh, who, um, other than the nine of us here, um, is there any, any other individuals? Um, if you could please give the notice about public comment, that would be great. If you'd like to use the public comment, uh, if you'd like to uh, participate in public comment section, please use the raise hand function. Doesn't appear to be anyone who would like to participate in the public comment portion. All right. Um, all right, thank you. And then I'm just gonna provide this note. If um, anybody who uh, would like to submit public comment, you may also do so by sending comments to Caitlin Del Calo um, of Senate staff and her email is C-A-I-T-L-I-N-D-E-L-C-O-L-L-O at Delaware.gov. Again, it's Caitlin Del Calo at Delaware.gov, C-A-I-T-L-I-N-D-E-L-C-O-L-L Oh, at Delaware.gov. Okay, um, so with that, we're at our closing comments. And again, I think like we begin, um, we'll, we'll end as we begin and just uh, go around the room and I'll try to do it in reverse order. So Robin, I'm gonna start with you in terms of our closing comments to see um, if there's anything specific you want us to handle on the 29th um, and any of your thoughts regarding our objectives for this group. Um, uh, I don't really have anything else to say. I think that this is a really good start and, um, and I'm happy to see that, you know, we're going to make some progress in making things affordable and accessible for, uh, those who really need it. Excellent. Thank you, Robin. And Kim? Um, I, I'm with Robin. This has really been um, a very helpful first session for me. Um, and it gives me um, just not only the opportunity to help participate, but start to think about how this information could be shared with other professionals um, that are in the homes caring for the people that we hope to um, most support. So thank you. Thank you, Kim. Um, Jamie? Thank you. Um, the, the only other thing I was gonna share, th thank you for your time and everything today. I think it's been a good first meeting. Um, I had, prior to um, the start of the meeting, I printed off the, the subgroups and, and the objectives. Um, and the only thing that I feel like we might not have really you know, dived in into is, um, the review of state regulations, I'm just gonna read it off. It was on this, sub, again, the subgroup definition. Review state regulations and licensure procedures and identify any policies that hinder the provision of services significantly more than, than they benefit. So I don't, I don't know that we've really honed in on that aspect, um, but I, I, do feel, I do feel that there's some, you know, maybe some low hanging fruit there. <laughs> All right, great, great point. We will add that to our agenda for discussion for the 29th, Julie. Thank you for pointing that out. I, I appreciate that. Amy? Absolutely, thank you for your time. Thank you. Amy?
Amy, it says you're not on mute, but we can't hear you. So uh, here I am. Sorry, I was on my phone. Um, I agree with Jamie. I think for me, we we need to hone in still on what we're going to do. And then the detail, for instance, what you were saying, Jamie, I think it's going to be critical. For me, I'm just trying to figure out where what we're doing might end and what really is included in this particular thing. So I think when everybody comes back with their priorities, I think that will help. And then we can say we need more information on this and this and this. So that's good. Excellent. Thank you, Amy. And Julie. Yeah, I agree with what everybody said. I'm also interested in um, what's happening around the country. What are the promising practices related to aging in place? Um, and, you know, how states are helping people afford to age in place. I know Washington has a great model. And so, you know, I plan on doing some homework around that as well. Um, and seeing what kind of um, policies are out there, legislation that's out there. Wonderful. I love that idea of looking at what other jurisdictions are doing. And we might even be able to, when doing your homework, if you find a, a leader out there in Washington that's really led the charge on this, um, we could invite him or her to participate in our next and one of our future meetings to and, and then give everybody an opportunity in advance to sort of learn about the Washington State program. And then um, when that person comes on, we can have some really good questions for, for them um, to help us. Well, this has been terrific. Thank you. I, I think we have a really terrific group here. I'm looking forward to our work um, and our, you know, being pragmatic and, and helpful um, and, and really looking at, at those, um, those issues that are present barriers um, that we can actually help move. Um, really, I really believe that we can do that as, as part of this group. So that's a, that's a tremendous honor for me uh, to, help, uh, to help on um, given I think we've all seen the horror stories and, and what can be really difficult and heartbreaking. And to the extent that we can change some of that is terrific. So um, again, our homework for the next meeting is to really come up with that brainstorm list of the, the biggest things that you see as barriers uh, for individuals staying in their home in a legal financial uh, world. Um, any colleagues of yours or others that you admire in, in this work that you think would be helpful to join us? And then, um, any other topic that you think we need to cover? We, we discussed the regulation piece that will be on our next agenda, but if there's something in the meantime um, that you also wanna add, um, will be terrific. And um, our next meeting, uh, barring any barriers to FOIA, which I'll confirm after this meeting, will be November 29th at 11. So if you could, I think to be productive, it's helpful to have that information shared with one another. Um, I'll have myself or my staff send out an email asking you to send in um, to Julie and I your, um, your list, your brainstorm list, so that we could share that with you as a group next week, or excuse me, two weeks from today, uh, so you can see it. So if it's possible, and I know Thanksgiving's coming up, but if you could get that to, to us by a week from Wednesday, um, that would be terrific. And that way we ha have a few days to be able to share it with you in advance of Monday's meeting. Sound good? Sounds good. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you everybody. And um, that I believe concludes our meeting today. I'm gonna turn it over to DTI to see what it is we need to do at this point to sign off. Can our friends at DTI help with that? Uh just let me know when the stream is over. I'll end the live and you guys can all pop out and do what you got to do. Okay. Well, I think the stream is over at 11.59 a.m. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful day. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.